Hey folks, Joe Valley here, and this is another episode of the Quiet Life Podcast. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Today's episode is brought to you by, yes, the Exitpreneur's Playbook. It's a book that launched on June 15th, and it's a uh, full M&A book focused on online sales only. You can find it at exitpreneur.io or just do a search on Amazon. If you own an online business and you've ever thought about exiting and you want the ultimate guide to selling your online business, as Mr. Walker Dival says, definitely check out the Exitpreneur's Playbook. Now, on to today's guest. He is a two-time guest. We've had him on the past. He is a high-performance coach, somebody that I am personally uh, meeting with next week to see if uh, I can get better at what I do, and I'm sure I can because there's a lot of improvement in my world. Um, he's also the CEO of a company called Focus CEO, David Wood. Welcome back to the Quiet Light Podcast. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you again. And so soon after I just interviewed you. I know. I know. It's This is, you and I have, have chatted with each other, you know, in the last 10 days, a couple of times. All new to the folks listening, though. Can you give them a, a little bit more background on yourself and uh, what your life and purpose is all about? Yeah. Well, I started in a country town in Australia and uh, apparently I got really good at left brain stuff. Uh, I had some trauma as a kid uh, watching my little sister die and uh, I was seven years old and she was five. And what happened, and I didn't know this until later in life when I went to therapy, is I shut down the emotional side and I developed the left brain. So I came top of my school I got a scholarship. I got paid to go to university. And then I landed a job on Park Avenue in New York, consulting to Sony Music and Ford and Exxon and these big companies. And that's at the age of 23, 24. Wow. So I figured I had it made. And then someone recommended a personal development course because I wasn't very happy. And I thought, I don't want to be a self-help junkie. I don't want to, you know, these people can't think for themselves. And I just had such a negative opinion of it. But I went along anyway, even though they wore name tags and they smiled way too much. And they cracked my cynicism. They cracked my heart. And I realized that I knew nothing about emotional intimacy, vulnerability, communication, leadership, transparency. I knew nothing about those things. So the first half of my life was all about getting really good at helping people make money. And the second half of my life has been more about freedom, emotional freedom, personal freedom, location freedom, time freedom. And so now when someone comes to me, I say, look, if you just want more money, go to somebody else. There are loads of people who that's all they focus on. I, come to me if you want more money and you want your life to be better. Yeah. You want to show up as a more extraordinary entrepreneur and human. That's where I get excited. And that's, that's why I'm excited to have my, my meeting with you next week. You know, I've been self-employed since 1997, almost 24 years now. Uh, partner at Quiet Light, uh, a company that now has a total of 15 advisors and growing like crazy. Um, money's not the issue. It's managing my time well and doing what makes me happy and fills my cup at this, at this point in my career. And I think that's critically important because I, I sense, David, that, you know, uh, being happier and more focused on what I do, and, you know, this is what you probably work with folks on, I'm actually going to be more productive uh, in the time that I spend on the things that I'm enjoying more. And that's probably going to help others within the firm do better and be more successful as we help more people. And ultimately it's all going to come back to my, my pocketbook. I'll be happier, but uh, happier with the uh, level of money I'm making as well. Is that sort of, am I, am I yeah. on the right path in terms of what we're going to chat about next week? Yeah. What, what came up for me is Colonel Sanders and I, just brought up this, this story for me. He said, Colonel Sanders said, uh, had four words. We do chicken right. Yeah. Right. It wasn't, we do hamburgers. We do steaks. We do, you know, uh, sushi. It was, it was, we do chicken right. Mm -hmm. And Colonel Sanders went really deep and had some success we might say. And so it's the same for a business owner. 
over the next 12 months, what's your version of that? If we try and do everything, we're not going to do it very well. We're going to be scattered. Now we will have open and we'll have adrenaline and we'll have stress and we'll feel very busy. But I don't think that's where the real gold is. That's not where the real cheese is. The real cheese is we do chicken right. So over the next year, what's, what's the chicken for you? And then over the next week, what's chicken for you? If you're going to do one thing right this next seven days, what is it? And then we can bring it right back till tomorrow. What are you going to do tomorrow? Are you going to try and do chicken and hamburgers and steak and sushi? Or are you going to do chicken right? And then same for the next 25 minutes. We bring it right back down. We're doing a sprint. I got a sprint book for two hours. Everything's turned off. I'm going to dive right in. What are you going to do? Hamburgers, sushi, noodles, or are you going to pick one thing and do it well? So the answer is yes. You had it. You had it. That's the uh, that's the challenge with entrepreneurs is that we think we can do everything and we love to be under pressure and we get shiny object syndrome and uh, we have an affliction uh, and it's called I can do that. And the problem is that we try to do everything. So I like the narrowing of the focus. Um, part of what you and I have talked about in the past, and I remember we sat down at Blue Ribbon Mastermind at one point, and um, some of the advice you gave me at that point, you don't actually know this yet. So this is news to you. Some of the advice you gave me has worked its way into the Expreneur's Playbook when it comes to setting goals. And part of it is a happiness goal. It's not just about you know, money and dollars. It's about happiness as well. Um, how do you work with folks in, in terms of their happiness goal in, in, in regards to the business? Yeah. Well, when people come to me, the first thing I ask is, what do you want? Now, sometimes they know. More likely, they have an idea, but they needed someone to ask that question, and then we go into it. And... I start with 12 months. Okay, a year from now, what would have to have happened for you to feel really happy with your progress? I also like to ask, what would have you do the happy dance? Now, their mind might start with business because that pays the bills, and so that's a good place to start. Usually there's a revenue target. Okay, let's get clear on what that looks like and if that's doable. And then I ask, how much time off do you want? A lot of people don't think about that. But if yeah. you're working 40 hours or say 60 hours a week now, what do you want it to look like a year from now so that you can really enjoy your life? And then, I, so often they have three business goals. And then I say, why don't you come up with three personal goals? And for some people, that's a stretch because mm. the mind resists a little bit. Um, but maybe, maybe they've wanted to run a marathon that's for years and they never got around to it. Or maybe they want to feel 50% closer to their partner or have their kids trust them 50% more. I think these are wonderful questions to dig into so we can find out for each person, what would have you do the happy dance? Mm. Brilliant. I can't wait to have this conversation next week. Uh, let, let's talk about some of the things that, um, you know, for specifically for the audience. Um, you know, one of the things that we thought we'd cover today was courage and a little line that, that you had said, how 30% more courage can, you know, uh, help you double your revenue and increase your happiness as well. Can you delve into the courage aspect a little bit for the entrepreneurs that are out there grinding it out, running their businesses trying to keep up with inventory, trying to keep up yeah. with content writers. Yeah. Just one, of the, one of the things we learn is how to be comfortable I think that from an early age. And we, you know, we, want, we want our chair to go back further in the plane. We want our cup of tea to stay hot the whole time. We're looking for comfort and we tend to shy away from things that are going to be uncomfortable, like, telling a woman I'm attracted to her when I've just met her, right? That might be edgy and, and risky and uncomfortable. In the business, we might not go and speak to a, a group because that'll be scary. Or we might not ask that celebrity for an endorsement. Or we might not talk to our staff member about showing up late to meetings because it'd be a bit awkward and, you know, 
They're mm. so sensitive. Maybe it's going to be a whole thing. So we learn, unfortunately, to have comfort as the default. And the thing is, most of the rewards, most of the good stuff lies in the discomfort zone because most people aren't going there. Yeah. So I, I like to talk about something called deliberate discomfort, practice deliberate discomfort, and you can do it in your um, – you can do it in your personal life. One example for me is a cold shower. Ooh. It's pretty scary for me. Yeah, cold shower, scary for me too. Like, what's going on? You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's a really good example. Once you do it a few times, let's say you do it seven, fourteen, twenty-one times, the body starts to get used to it, and it's now you can have the health benefits uh, of the cold shower and not be so freaked out anymore. It's the same in our relationships and it's the same in our business. So here's a great exercise. If you want the rewards that lie in the discomfort zone, take a piece of paper and write at the top of that piece of paper, what would I do if I was fearless? Hmm, okay. What would my life look like? And you can start to paint on a blank canvas. I would call... 50 prospects and ask them if they want to work with me. I would approach Richard Branson, write the forward to my book. I would go, uh, go and pitch myself as a, as a speaker at not TEDx, but TED, you know, I'm making this stuff up, but you write it down. What would it be for you and include some conversations? If you are fearless, what would you say to your staff? What would you say to someone who's been annoying you? What would you say to the people that you want more from? I'll, I'll give you an example of an ed me. I just thought of it. Um, I'd like to get a housing loan, but my income's weird with Australia and the US, and, and I'm not sure I can get a bank to back me, even though I'm confident making the payments. So I'd like to ask a friend if he might uh, be open to co-signing my loan. That's edgy for me. That's a real edge. And so um, I think I'm going to do it. I also encourage to, to post it on my, uh, I have a smaller Facebook group with just my closest friends. And I thought I could post it there and maybe someone's got surplus credit and they're like, Hey, I know you're good for it. You, you know, particularly since I'd put up not just the U S property that I buy, but I have an Australian property I'd put up as collateral that yeah. these U S banks don't care about. But that's an example of what I might write down. I could ask, my friends to see if someone would want to co-sign a loan for me. Yeah. I heard somebody, so, uh, you know, recently that they said, basically your, your greatest potential is just outside of your comfort zone. And if you, if you live within your comfort zone, you're never going to reach your greatest potential. Question though, is how do you decide which, you know, where in that discomfort zone you want to be and how often you want to be there? Cause again, it's back to that, singular focus so that you're achieving that 12 month goal, that 10 month goal, that six month, that 25 minute goal. Yeah. How do you, what do you do first? Pick those yeah, well, things you're going to focus on or, or, or the discomfort zone? Well, the first step would be that piece of paper I just mentioned and asking yourself, what would life look like if I was fearless? Now, if you're working with a coach or in a mastermind or in a men's group or a woman's group or something like that, you can ask those people where do you think I'm holding back? Mm. Ask your partner. <clears throat> ask your kids. Mm. Where do you ask your friends? Where do you feel like I'm holding back? I've got a, a friend I was coaching a little bit yesterday who wants to create a, a drone footage company, creating videos for real estate companies and whatever. And so I was going to hook him up with a connection and then he got scared. He's like, oh, wait, I've got all this stuff in my life that isn't sorted out yet. Maybe I should do all that first. I said, that's a valid move. Or you could do it all. Get your, you know, you're not going to work 24-7. So get your life in order and create a little time to move forward. He was really confronted. So we found pretty quickly where his edge was. Uh, I had a podcast interview a podcast host was, was interviewing me and she asked me for coaching. So I coached her and at the end, <clears throat> she realized the thing that was scaring her was really going forward with the book launch. She was playing it so small and holding back because she was that the world wouldn't really want the book. At the end of the coaching, she said, 
wow, I did not realize that fear was running the show. I'm now going to dive fully into the launch and excuse me while I go and throw up for a second. All right, let me just uh, interrupt you right now. Hear that. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you right now and and give a specific fearless message to the audience. I wrote the Exitpreneur's book for you. Uh, please go and buy it. Share it with friends and give us a positive review so that we can reach the goal of a million online entrepreneurs so that they better understand the value of their business. It's not about me, it's about you. I want the book sales to produce education and information to help you get more value for your business if and when you eventually exit it. It works for buyers too. If you're a buyer of online businesses and you buy the book, you're going to be able to discover instant equity in the businesses that you're buying if the person that is selling their business didn't research the material in the book as well. Okay. Over, I interrupted you to give out my own fearless message and to ask for what I want, which is I want people to buy this book, David. How do others do that uh, in their business if they've got staff? Okay, go ahead. I need to, I need to do something. Go ahead. Yeah, let's not, let's not skip over that moment. How was that for you to, to ask for what you wanted just then? The I feel like that? I have to apologize in some ways for asking for what I want, which is um, weird, right? Uh, this, this, this broker stigma that I've always had makes me feel apologetic for asking uh, people to do certain things when the reality is I am just here to help. And I've had 8,000 one-on-one conversations with entrepreneurs over the last nine years. I can't keep up that pace. And what I've learned over that process is now in the book. It's the first of its kind. It's a M&A book focused strictly on online businesses geared towards um, not the Harvard MBA Wharton graduates. It's geared towards the bootstrap entrepreneur that all of a sudden well, woke up. I, and they've got may, I, may I interrupt you for a moment? Of course. This is your podcast. I want to, I want to, I, I well, it's actually yours, but <laughs> I, I want to interrupt because I, I don't want to get away from what just happened, the fearless, yeah. which was you just, you realized in conversation, oh, I just found an edge for me. I just found a little edge, which is just being very clear up front, boom, this is what I want you guys to do. It's going to be great for you. It's going to be good for me too. It's going to be good for everybody. And you are self-expressed. And I'm excited about that because that's what I want for everyone. Now, for some people, that'd be easy on a podcast. So the question is, what is it for you? What is your edge? Uh, And you just brought up, Joe, the um, idea about staff. A lot of people have some real issues around staff. There might be some stuff that's a bit awkward to say to someone, hey, uh, you know, you, I've asked you three times to do something and it's not happening. Mm. I'm really curious, what's going on? Right? Sometimes that's the edge. It might be asking you, your wife or your husband, hey, there's something I'd like in the bedroom and I'm nervous to talk about it because maybe you're not into it and that's going to be awkward. But can we have a, con- can we have a real conversation about in our ideal world, what we might have in our sex life. That's edgy for a lot of people. Find out what it is for you. I quickest way that I know of is coaching. Coaching or a mastermind or therapy or something like that. Because it's in the conversations that we start to go, oh, wait a minute. I didn't even see it. That that's an edge. That's where I'm holding back. Now, you don't have to do everything. Once you realize, say you've got that, that list on your sheet of paper of the things that you would do if you were fearless. I'm not saying you have to go and do all of it tonight. Some of it you may never do. But the first step is awareness because the mind hides these things from us. We want to dig them up and go, okay, this is an edge for me. This is an edge for me. This is a bit scary. Um, this one's easy. And then you might want to go through the list and just circle two or three things as a practice for this week and go and do those to get your feet wet and practice deliberate discomfort. And you might find if it goes well and you enjoyed the process, or at least you enjoyed the rewards, you might circle another two or three things on the list and so you keep doing for, that. I am so looking forward to our conversation next week. You know, it's, it's funny. It's, so much material is out there and available in, in book format, right? There's 
the one thing, which is, you know, part of what you're talking about. You focus in on that one thing. I've read the book. I've read, you know, dozens of self-help uh, business books, but I don't think that any of them can hold a candle to a conversation with somebody that's in the space and an expert in their field. What I do sometimes find difficult, though, is the idea of the mastermind. When you talk about mastermind, are you talking about, you know, um, a mastermind focused on breaking out of your comfort zone in business and in life? Or are you talking about that business mastermind? Because sometimes the business mastermind is all about, you know, gaining organic rankings, or if it's a FBA business, it might be, you know, Amazon hacks. What type of mastermind are you referring to when you talk about this? Well, if it's a mastermind that, that confronts you and that asks you the tough questions and has you realizing and learning, then I think, I think that's a good mastermind. If it's one where you just get knowledge, that's great too. That's great too. Um, I it think does, it doesn't have to be both. either or. Yeah. No, I think we could use both. We could use some, some source of education, so constantly learning about what matters. I think we can also use um, Tucky Moore as a coach that I've followed for some time. And he says, hire cheap hands and expensive heads. Oh, so, okay. you know, for doing the actual work in the business, get people at the lowest price you can. But for advice and for coaching and for breaking outside of your paradigm, pay good money for that. And I, I thought that made a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a, it's a heck of a lot of sense. Okay. Light bulbs going off here and there, which is a problem, right? Because there's so many things that I want to do, but I've got to put down on a list. What would I do if I was fearless? And I have an idea of what it is. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm very yeah. much looking. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Uh, you said you have an idea of what it is. Yeah. You, you want to share it with us? <laughs> um, uh, sure. Um, the, uh, I, I believe the book um, can be a, a, a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, and that takes five to 10,000 sales in one week uh, with 10% of those coming from Barnes and Noble. And we're not doing that on the launch of July, June 15th, simply because the Barnes and Noble site's not, it's going to be open. So, uh, you know, openly stating this is, this is the goal. There's, there's two it's wall street journal bestseller list. Cause that will just get more exposure and help more people. Um, uh, but ultimately to, um, sell a, a million books. And the reality is that most, uh, most authors sell about 300 books in their first 12 months. I'd like to sell a hundred thousand books because it's, helping people. I don't care if I break even, uh, you know, it would be helping a hundred thousand people understand the true value of their business. I love your clarity. You, you're like, all right, I, I already know what, what's edgy for me. Boom, boom, boom. Bestseller. Uh, I love that. I want that clarity for everyone. We won't always choose to go forward. That's okay. I don't, I don't do everything I'm afraid of. I'm it's interesting because it, you know, it's, I'm a little afraid to say it, to share the goals for fear of explaining that I didn't achieve them. And in fact, oddly, and there's always going to be naysayers in this world, and, and maybe you've got some advice on how to deal with them. My, in my situation, I just ignored them. Um, I, uh, I shared the book with someone who has a fairly substantial podcast. And uh, it's weird. He had me on the podcast and helped, but he also told me that not on the podcast itself. He's like, yeah, this, there's not a wide audience for this book. Don't expect it to be a bestseller. I'm like, why in the world would you say that to anyone? A, and B, I'm going to prove you so dead wrong. I'm never going to tell you that I'm proving you wrong and doing it with the intention of proving you wrong. I think the audience is huge, but how do you how do you deal with the naysayers as you're becoming fearless and setting goals and trying to achieve them? I hear about naysayers a lot. I don't tend to meet them for some reason. Like, like my friends are, mm. are pretty amazing and they're like, yeah, man, you go for it. That's amazing. Um, so I don't experience it myself. Well, the lesson there might be to uh, surround yourself with the right people. That, 
that could be it. I mean, definitely if you've got a good mastermind or a therapist or a coach, they're not going to be telling you you can't do it. Although that's not true all the time. Sometimes my job is to be a reality check. But you've got to be so careful with that because maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I might say, can I play devil's advocate? You know, let's poke it a little bit, see if there's some holes. But I don't want to, I don't want to quench the fire. We might have to adjust the plan. We might have to adjust the goals. But I've had people say, I think it's absolutely possible to 10x in the next 12 months. And here's why. Okay, great. All right, let's settle. But if they're like, no, I want to 10x, you know, in the next 12 months, but they, they haven't really thought through it, we've got to see if this actually has a foot in reality. Right. Right. But yeah, yeah. we want a sweet spot. But if someone's telling you this is never going to be a bestseller, I love your reaction. Yes, it will. And I'm going to show you. My mother said that if she ever wanted to really get me to do something, the best way was to tell me it couldn't be done. Oh, yeah. Because oh, I'm yeah. like, oh, really? Yeah, let's just see. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a parenting thing. You know, I, I was at a track meet yesterday. A buddy of mine and I were talking about his, you know, 17-year-old, and he wants him to do certain things. But if he suggests it, guarantee the boy's not going to do it. <laughs> He's going to do the, just the opposite. So he has to find ways to uh, lead without letting the teenager know that he's leading. And I'm sure we have to do that with coworkers and staff and friends and in the business world as well. Well, you know, um, it's a bit like that with, with coaching. Um, in, like I can give ideas and suggestions and people want that from me because I've got a lot of experience. I might have some good ideas, but the best stuff, is if I can ask you a question and you come up with your own idea. It actually activates a different part of the brain. It's more likely to get stored in long-term memory, apparently, versus just what I told you, which could be gone tomorrow. So there's a whole you know, rationale behind that uh, that maybe is a little bit like parenting. Well, I think what you do is so necessary and so needed because a lot of us just wander through this entrepreneurial world aimlessly, um, guided by people that are no uh, uh, better at painting a clear picture than we are and helping us with that. So it's really therapy for business. That's what business coaching is. Oh, wow. That's right. really good. Yeah, therapy for business. Uh, it's look, sometimes what I do I'm sure crosses over into therapy land. I had one client hired me to increase revenue and then got diagnosed with cancer. Mm. So, you know, we're not going to skip over that. So I did a session with her and her, her husband and we went into what does this mean for you? And what game are you going to play now, now that your life expectancy is more uncertain than it was yesterday? What game are you going to play? What are you going to do with this information it was one of my most rewarding sessions all year because that's what was real. That's what was, that's what was coming up. Yeah. And it's, it's an awful thing to have, you know, cancer really set your eyes on how close you are to the end. I was talking to uh, an advisor of mine. Uh, he's been my, uh, one of my mentors over the years and he's, he's now 76 years old. And when he was in his, if, mid fifties, early sixties, he said that, uh, he had his own coach and that coach took a, a hundred yard, uh, tape, measuring tape, laid it out at the, uh, in the conference room that they were at. And all of the people in the room had to go up and stand on the measuring tape from zero to a hundred where you are age wise. And first you stand on it, looking back at zero, then you turn around, stand on it, looking at 100 or wherever your life expectancy is. And it made him go, holy shit, I, I'm, I'm, I'm near the end here. I really need to focus on what I love and what I enjoy and just forget about the rest of this stuff. So I thought that was a brilliant visual, visualization of it. Uh, wow, what a great way to get people to that realization. Yeah. One thing that happened for me that got my attention was when my paraglider collapsed. Ooh, I would and think that so, would. Yeah, and so I, I'd already had a couple of accidents in my life as a hang glider pilot and then flying a paraglider, full collapse at 300 feet, I'm plummeting towards the earth and it's too low for a parachute, for a backup parachute to work. Um, 
I walked away from that one, but then a couple of years later, I was only 15 feet above the ground and had a partial collapse of the, of the wing and landed on my butt. Oh. That's not an experience you want to have. So it was a good day, though, going to the uh, hospital in an ambulance, and I had fractured my spine. But, I look, I just found out a friend of mine um, has prostate cancer, and he's doing radio, you know, and he's, he's like, my, he's younger than me. I think I'm 52. I've realized that the illusion of I'm going to be around forever is really just that. And yeah. I don't know, between you and me and all our listeners, I don't know if I'm going to make it another year. I think I will. My chances are good, but I don't know. I've, I've missed a car accident by like an inch. I've been in a car accident. It could be a, a disease, it could be COVID, it could be, uh, there was a shooting in Boulder what, last month, one yeah. month before, right? Yeah. Shooting in Boulder, six people killed. Um, it really is an illusion of safety that we have. And I want that illusion because I want to be able to relax my nervous system. But I, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it through the year. And that impacts my choices. Instead of oh, I'm not going to buy that uh, Oculus virtual reality headset. Hmm. I might say, I don't know if I'm going to be around a year from now, and it's not a huge expense. I think I'm going to do it. Instead of saying, I'm not going to tell that person, that woman I'm attracted to her and I'd like to date her, sometimes it's like, you know what? I don't know if I'll be around next year. Why not do it? Let's do it. So whatever gets you there, whether it's this tape measure, or a near-death experience, or listening to this podcast with Joe Valley. Um, let's live so that when we are gone, we could look back from the afterlife or wherever, wherever we are and say, I gave it everything. Mm. I love that. That's fantastic, David. This has been enlightening, and, and I always feel good after talking with you. Last time we had on the podcast, my, my breakfast or lunch or whatever we had done, and in St. Pete's. It's always good to talk to you, man. I really appreciate it. Um, how do people learn more about you, get in touch with you, that type of thing? Thank you. I've created a gift basket of goodies for listeners. So one is a cheat sheet on how to achieve twice as much in half the time. There's a six minute video, which will take you deeper into it. So you can actually apply the cheat sheet. But it doesn't take you a lot of time and you'll be reaping dividends from that uh, for the rest of your life. If you want to get on a 15-minute call with me and identify the low-hanging fruit in your business, I'm happy to do that with people because it's how I find the right clients to work with. And you can do all of that plus join the Kickstarter campaign for the Name That Mouse book because the elephant is not the only animal in the room. And it's all about courageous communication. It's about you being the badass leader and human that people want to be around. And I do believe this book is going to change the world. So you can get all of these at one special link that will take you to a hidden page on my site. It's myfocusgift.com. Myfocusgift.com. I will make sure that's in the show notes as well for folks to go back to if they can't remember. Myfocusgift.com myfocusgift.com. Awesome, David. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, being part of your Kickstarter and getting your book when it's all said and done. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you again. You too. Thank you, David.